So first of all, good evening, everybody, and welcome. Uh, for those of you on the screen, we've got a fantastically full audience here tonight. Uh, so welcome to this panel discussion on uh, the role of whistleblowing in detecting and preventing corruption. Um, and we meet today on a very sombre um, evening when our focus on tackling corruption at home has to be overshadowed by the events in the Ukraine today. Um, and that explains why we had hoped to have both uh, Margaret Hodger and John Penrose with us in person, but uh, there's obviously been a very important debate that they've had to attend in the House this evening. But we're delighted to welcome you both uh, today. I should have introduced myself. I'm Liz Gardner. I'm the Chief Executive of Protect, the UK's whistleblowing charity. And we've been delighted to team up with Lee Day to bring you this event this evening. Um, in a moment, I'll just set the scene a little bit about uh, whistleblowing and corruption, but I, I'll introduce you first to our, our panel, each of whom is going to speak to you for about five minutes, and then we hope to have some time at the end for some questions. So, John Penrose is a Conservative MP for Western Supermare. He's a former minister and the government's independent anti-corruption champion, a role he's held since 2017 and which he both supports and challenges the government on corruption. Um, and he's also chair of the Conservative Policy Forum. So you're very welcome, John, today. And Dame Margaret Hodge, many of you will know, is a Labour MP for Barking, former minister, former chair of the Public Accounts Committee, and currently chairs the all-party parliamentary group on anti-corruption and responsible taxation. Um, she's a stalwart campaigner against corruption and very much in support of whistleblowing. We're also joined online today by Jonathan Taylor, uh, a whistleblower himself who exposed a major bribery scandal in the oil industry. And he's going to be talking to you about the personal experience and the retaliation that whistleblowers can face, in his case, over many years and across continents. Um, and then we hear from Paul Dowling, a specialist international human rights lawyer here at, and a partner here at Lee Day. Uh, Paul successfully represented Amjad Rehan, who was a former pa partner at Ernst & Young, and he blew the whistle on uh, money laundering and conflict minerals concerns in the United Arab Emirates. Amjad was eventually awarded over £8 million in damages, and his case broke some new ground in whistleblowing protection, so we look forward to hearing that too. And last but not least, we have our own Andy Pepper Parsons, who's Head of Policy at Protect, and he's going to focus on how the legal home framework might be improved to ensure that whistleblowing concerns about corruption are heard and addressed with less risk to those individuals who speak up. But just before we go to the panel, I'm... I just want to briefly set the scene because protect, we start from the position that whistleblowers provide a vital function in detecting and preventing corruption. Time after time, whistleblowers are going to be the first to identify and to speak up about corrupt practices, whether it's to their employer, to a regulator, to law enforcement bodies or to the press. It's estimated that 43% of fraud is detected by tip-offs and 50% of that comes from whistleblowers. So given the vital service that whistleblowers could be providing in organisations and holding both organisations and governments to account, the question is this, why are so many ignored and retaliated against? Why do so many have to go to the press to have their concerns taken seriously? And what can we all do to get employers, regulators, law enforcement agencies and the government to see whistleblowers as an asset in the fight against corruption. And I don't need to tell any of you here that corruption and economic crime is big business. It's rarely out of the news, as we've seen from headlines this week about the Credit Suisse failures to prevent corruption uh, revealed by an anonymous whistleblower. And that's not unusual. Wherever you see these public scandals, the chances are high there are whistleblowers involved, often ignored sometimes harmed by their attempts to speak up and often after the event also calling out that culture that prevented them from speaking up or being listened to. Uh, last month, Spotlight on Corruption produced a report which sets out the mind-boggling figures. Corruption cost the UK economy an estimated £290 billion. That's equal to 14.5% of our GDP. The Treasury Select Committee this month noted an upward trend in the economic crimes of bribery, corruption, uh, fraud, tax evasion and money laundering. Transparency International UK reported that over 2,000 companies registered in the UK have been linked with 48 money laundering and corruption cases involving Russia. Now, some of those may be sham companies just set up for the purposes 
of corruption, but surely some of those companies where corruption occurring, somebody has seen the wrongdoing. Are they too scared to speak up? Have they spoken up to the wrong person or have they spoken up only to be ignored? What's going wrong? But corruption isn't just about the big business and the money laundering. It happens across all sectors. Eight and a half million was lost to charities last year through fraud. And as we saw at Protect during the um, COVID crisis, it also affects small businesses. We, ha we saw an unprecedented uh, rise in concerns about fraud on our advice line last year when furlough, free, furlough leave was introduced. Uh, employers were claiming the furlough money but requiring their staff to come and work anyway. And many of those workers wanted to whistleblow about what they knew was wrongdoing. Now, HMRC says around 30,000 people contacted them about the various schemes that were put in place to help uh, during this coronavirus. But still, 8% of coronavirus job retention scheme payments were lost to fraud and error. Could more effective whistleblowing arrangements have reduced those losses? Well, there's some good news, and that's that the government has an anti-corruption strategy. And one of the key goals, and I quote, is a more open government that is trusted by citizens with robust protections for whistleblowers. And yet, as we come to the end of the strategy period, two of the key whistleblowing goals, including a review of the whistleblowing framework here in the UK, are off track. And I quote, serious risk to delivery. Put bluntly, whistleblowing reform is overdue and those ro robust protections are yet to emerge. In too many sectors, there are no whistleblowing channels, no independent places where individuals can go outside of line management. And that safety valve of whistleblowing is just not present and that needs fixing. Whistleblowers have two fears. They fear that they'll be retaliated against for speaking up and they fear that nothing will happen if they do. So what do we need to do to improve the response that they get from their employers, from regulators and from enforcement agencies? Because there is, in a simple, cheap uh, way to detect and, detect and deter corruption, and it lies with workers inside organisations. So what do we get, need to do to get the government to take whistleblowing more seriously as part of the solution? And on that note, I'm going to turn to our first speaker, uh, anti-corruption champion John Penrose, who I hope can update us on the strategy and how you think the role of whistleblowing in detecting and preventing fraud might be strengthened. Over to you, John. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And thank you to Lee Day and to, and to um, everybody involved in organising this event today. Really pleased to, to hold it. I mean, I appreciate, as you say, that it's happening at a, at a moment when we might be overshadowed by terrible events happening in Ukraine, and those matter, obviously. Um, but this is something which, while not quite as immediately urgent today, is really, really important, and your, your uh, introduction just now um, ably laid it out. Um, so I, I'd start by saying you are absolutely right to say that whistleblowing is not just vital, it's also really effective if it's done right. Um, and we are miles off the pace from where we ought to be. The, you're right to point out and the, the, the uh, anti-corruption strategy updates, which we publish every year. I'm, I'm insisting that if we're going to publish an anti-corruption strategy update, update, we need to walk the talk, which means it's got to be properly, uh, properly uh, transparent. And that means being honest when we're off track. And this is one of the areas where we are. And so you're also right to point out that my role involves both support and challenge. Um, and so I hope everyone will understand, given the fact that we're off track in this area, um, if what I'm about to say is rather heavier on the challenge um, than perhaps on the support, because we have to up our game, and we have to up, up it quite significantly. I, mean, I think it's worthwhile pointing out that you know, 10 plus years ago, Britain's whistleblowing uh, framework was regarded as pretty cutting edge, and we, we were pretty good. Um, but the world has moved on, um, crim criminals and crime have moved on. You just explained, um, and rightly so, that broadly speaking, the old-fashioned business of making, breaking into bank vaults or making off with bars of gold or anything like it is, is an old man's crime now. Um, most crime has migrated online, and online fraud and scams um, is the vast growing um, criminal industry at the moment. Um, and therefore, yeah, having good whistleblowing um, practice and also applying it properly right the way across the economy, so it isn't just having the right legal framework, it's also making sure it's being properly implemented in all the necessary sectors um, is essential, not least because, as, as you said, and, as, and I would agree, it works. I mean, it's incredibly effective and it's cost effective too. It, it is a force multiplier for anything which um, the, the police or the National Crime Agency or the Civil Office can possibly do. 
um, and it just basically you know, massively improves and increases their range, their scope, and their penetration as well. So what do I think we need to do? Well, there is a series of, of, of things that are existing framework, I think, is um, is now being left behind by the way the world is today, and we need to therefore look at upgrading it. There's a new version of the strategy, which is due to be being developed, anti-corruption strategy being developed in the course of the coming year, um, and I hope that that will include some commitments to cover some of the areas which I'm going to be mentioning in it. Um, but also, there's a crucial point about just implementing what we've already got much more effectively, much more thoroughly, uh, and making sure that where there are not um, adequate uh, 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 whistleblowing um, opportunities in individual sectors, um, that, you know, that things happen rather than everyone just standing around and wringing their hands. Let me talk about some of the... the uh, the, the, the shortcomings, if I can, as, as a way of sort of getting the, the, the conversation going. The first one is the, the who counts as a protected person. Um, at the moment, we, we tend to make, focus mainly on staff, but there's a whole range of other people who may come into contact with wrongdoing in any organization, be it pri private sector, for-profit, be it not-for-profit, be it public sector. And those include the suppliers, they also include some customers, they certainly include uh, non-executive directors and many other classes of people. They need to be covered and protected um, where necessary so that they can whistleblow if necessary. We also need to be a bit more accurate about what we count as a qualifying disclosure, what kind of, uh, of, uh, of, of whistleblowing, um, if I stand up and do it, will get, earn me those protections and will make me know that I'm going to be protected and that needs to be visible up front because it requires a huge amount of bravery to be a whistleblower. Um, and you need to know um, not only that you're going to be properly protected, but also that the juice is worth the squeeze, that the chances of something happening to stop the thing that you've seen happening again is likely to, co to come about. And, and th those two things are equally vital. But thirdly, we need to, um, I think, deal with, uh, as you, I think you mentioned, the likelihood of retaliation. This is often not just a legal point, it's often also a cultural point, um, because particularly in, uh, in, in more established firms and organizations, um, but also in uh, uh, more, more established uh, professional cultures, um, it is all too pop, uh, common, quite apart from whatever the legal process may be, for everybody to close ranks on somebody who has stepped out of line or has uh, or has threatened other people who are senior than them in an organisation. So that's it's partly legal, but an awful lot of that is about leadership um, and about um, uh, organisational culture, be it be it private sector, be it public sector, be it third sector as well. Um, but equally. Uh, I guess the, the, the final point is there's a whole series of legal points which I will defer to Lee Day and others about um, to make sure that, for example, non-disclosure agreements um, don't apply when it comes to whistleblowing and that people don't feel that they could be monstered or stopped um, if they are needing to blow the whistle and that their contractual terms or non-disclosure agreements um, don't apply. So there's just a quick, a quick summary. I'm conscious that um, you rightly only want me to speak for five minutes because we need to allow time for both my other fellow panel members, but also um, for questions and comments from what I'm sure is an incredibly uh, educated and, uh, and astute audience. So I'll stop there, um, other than to say I'm looking forward to hearing what everybody else has to say, but I hope that has at least got everybody's juices flowing for the rest of the hour. Thank you very much. That's a really good start for the for the debate and, uh, and some really... Um positive comments there in terms of, of, of things that we would absolutely support you on in her, you know, shared shared aims in terms of uh, in some of the changes that we need. Do you think we need some um, legislation sooner rather than later? We've been hearing today about the economic crime bill. Um, do you think there's an opportunity there to sort of boost whistleblowing along the way? Um, it's a possibility. Um, I suspect probably, I, I think the economic crime bill, fully fledged, is going to be quite a big bill already. And there's all sorts of really important things in it, like reforms to companies' house, which, sure. given what's happening in Ukraine, you know, everyone will understand is, is sort of critical and urgent now. And so it's possible, but it may also be a bill that's very large already. I, I'm not sure I see, I haven't seen the sort of completed draft of it yet, so I don't know. But if it isn't, then my response, I think, would be, firstly, we need to get on with implementing what we've already got because there are too many sectors where even what we've got at the moment isn't being properly applied. And we can make a lot of progress without legislation and um, just in doing that properly, and demanding proper leadership and proper change, culture change programmes and, and, uh, and, and proper, uh, properly communicated and whistleblowing channels um, in organisations up and down the country. Um, but in due course, yes, we are going to need more uh, more powers and changes to those legal frameworks that I've just described. Um, we'll have to 
you know, tie ministers' feet to the floor uh, in order to get them to make firm commitments about precisely which of some of those ideas that I've just been suggesting they're willing to sign up to. But I hope at least it's given people a shopping list to begin with. Thank you very much, John. That's really helpful. So those of you who, many of you here will have read about Jonathan's uh, story um, and his background. But Jonathan uh, blew the whistle in 2013 on a multi-million international network of bribes paid by the Monaco-based Monaco Dutch oil company uh, SBM Offshore. And his evidence to the serious fraud office and other enforcement bodies around the world has resulted in fines, of uh, millions of pounds to SBM offshore and the imprisonment indeed of some senior staff. Jonathan left SBM, but the repercussions personally have continued. Uh, his former employer has tried unsuccessfully to bring a claim of defamation against him. And back in July 2020, he was arrested whilst on a family holiday in Croatia as a result of an Interpol red notice seeking his extradition to Monaco to answer charges that were initiated in, as retaliation against him by his former employer. Uh, now, Jonathan's had to fight his case through the Croatian courts, and it was almost a year before he was allowed home, although I think the case is still not yet closed. But his case and that of Amjad Rehan that we're going to hear about shortly are very extreme cases of whistleblowing, but the follow-up treatment that he's experienced um, may indeed have a chilling effect on others who are thinking of coming forward to reveal corruption. So, Jonathan, we're going to ask you just to give us a little bit of, of, uh, of a flavour of the experience that you've had after revealing corruption and the support, or, or maybe the lack of it, from, from the agencies that you've helped with the investigations. I'll give it a go. Um, so, if you were to gauge um, the success of uh, whistleblowing in terms of um, the results, the effect... Um, of the whistleblowing, and I, I guess I did quite well um, in terms of um, five different prosecutors fining my former employer over $850 million. Um, um, one of its former CEOs is in prison for three years, another was fined half a million euros, and uh, various um, imprisonments of other salesmen uh, at my former uh, company um, have also um, fo followed. Um, I was responsible for the resignation, wholesale resignation of what, what used to be the um, by market capitalization, the biggest company in the, in the Southern Hemisphere, Petrobras. That's the national oil and gas company of uh, of Brazil. I probably contributed to the downfall of Dilma Rousseff, who was um, uh, very much involved in 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 the, in the whole scandal um, as as the, as a former energy minister, and then. Um, uh, chairperson of uh, Petrobras and then the president of, of Brazil, who ultimately was impeached. Um, likewise, various kleptocrats, kleptocrats in Angola have been uh, identified, and now they're being pursued um, through the Portuguese um, courts. So all in all, I like to think that um, I have something to show <laughs> for my whistleblowing, and, and certainly the company could never claimed that it got away with it as much as it tried, as much as it tried to cover up its corruption. Um, I, I didn't hold back in, in making sure that, um, that their corruption was brought um, to justice. But um, if, however, you, you measure and gauge um, whistleblowing by the results to the individual, then I couldn't really have done much, much worse. Any potential corporates I'm talking about, when I ever, whenever I refer to whistleblower, of course, talk about corporate whistleblowers. Um, uh, I'm not talking about the Catherine Guns and the Ed Snowdens of this world. Um, uh, but anyone that knows uh, or has seen what's what's happened to me, I fear um, very much that they that will, it will what's what's going on with me and will cause um, potential whistleblowers in the future um, to back off. Um, that the results could not really have been uh, much more devastating for me. Um, the tip of the iceberg was 2015 when a SLAP, which an acronym stands for um, Strategic Lawsuit Against Public Participation, um, was issued against me, trying to silence me, um, trying to, to, to ruin me financially, and so I wouldn't be able to defend uh, the suit and, and have my former employer um, procure a statement uh, from me saying that all I had said um, was was totally untrue, uh, seeking an injunction against me from ever speaking again, 
um, through fear of being fined 10,000 euros per day for so long as the injunction was breached, as if you could unbreach it. Um, they were seeking damages of 630,000 um, euros from me. Um, they got an ex parte garnishy injunction against my house uh, and my uh, bank accounts. Um, uh, fortunately, I found a, a fine lawyer that acted for me um, uh, on a partially pro bono basis, and we filed an extremely good defence, 140 exhibits, um, and SBM used this uh, Dutch, this is where the proceedings were, were um, commenced, D Dutch legal tool called a Nilhil application, which had the effect of reducing their claim against me to zero, um, and causing the courts, as a reaction to that, to withdraw the case. So I never had my day in court. I was never able to de defend the defamation proceedings um, publicly. Um, and, um, and of course, the, the, you, you, the costs aren't awarded in, in the Dutch court. So what costs I did have to pay, it wasn't entirely pro bono, I had to pay. So they got away pretty much scot-free from trying to, to ruin me um, financially and, and probably mentally too. Yes, it did have that chilling effect which was intended, of course, um, for a few weeks. But fortunately, again, I found a fantastic um, Dutch lawyer um, who was able to uh, re re represent me and did a, a fine job. Um, Otto Volgenaut is his name. But that, as it turned out uh, to be the, the, the tip of the iceberg. Now I sit here. Um, my whistleblowing has um, cost me a year of my life. It has cost me my marriage. It has cost me my career. No one, um, my, I was a lawyer in the oil and gas industry. No one in the oil and gas industry will employ a lawyer who's been a whistleblower. It's cost me a year of my life. The effects could not really have been much more dramatic upon me. And it spells out to the world how ill-equipped the world is for whistleblowers like me. Now, I could just go away and, and be utterly miserable for the rest of my life uh, as a result of being a whistleblower, wondering what's going to happen next. I, I'm, I, I'm at my last point of my life right now. What I like and what I pray and what I hope will come of this is that people will see what happened to Taylor. And if they're going to pass legislation to um, support whistleblowers, let them make sure the legislation passes passes the Taylor test, because without that, it's not good enough. The world is not ready for whistleblowers yet. That is so profoundly obvious. I'm still being chased by the state of Monaco, persecuted um, uh, for, for a frivolous and vexatious um, uh, a charge, um, which I'm being told apparently next week whether it's going to be dropped after um, th this is the whole reason that a red notice was issued against me in Monaco. Uh, sorry, in in in, um, in Croatia. That's still the story is still is still continuing. It still um, has not come to an end. But again, what I want, I want what I I don't want to feel that all my time has, has been wasted. Other than of course um, making sure I did bring corruption to justice when it came to SBM. I would I would implore that lawmakers. If they don't already know my case, look at my case, look what happened to me and pass legislation that seeks to protect people like me. Otherwise, you know, we're going in the, we're not going in the right direction. And as I said, the, the world is not equipped for whistleblowers at the moment. That's my five minutes for now. I just, this is the first time I've met Dame Margaret Hodge to the extent, to the extent we're meeting at all. And can I just please send out my heartfelt Thanks to you, Margaret, for all the help and assistance you levied uh, for me when I was in that shocking uh, year of exile in Croatia um, being pursued. Thank you so very much. That's all from me for now. Thank you, Jonathan. That was incredibly moving and powerful. Um, uh, speech about about, you know, both the, the, the incredible um, corruption that you revealed and the incredible impact it's had on you. Um, I think it's going to be quite hard, but we've got the right person to follow that. We're very pleased that we can welcome back Dame Margaret Hodge. Um, and, uh, and as Jonathan said, she's been an absolute uh, star in terms of raising Jonathan's case in Parliament all that year he was in Croatia. So pleased to welcome you back again, uh, Dame Margaret, and the floor is yours for the next few minutes.
Yeah, sincere apologies, and thank goodness I could come back. And I did hear most of that, Jonathan. And I was hoping that the, the, the one um, uh, th thing I was hoping tonight was to meet you in person. So I'm sorry we haven't done that. And perhaps we can do that on another occasion. And I salute you for your bravery. And uh, I thought that was a very emotional and, and difficult speech you made. I congratulate you on, on, on doing that tonight. Um, I, I'm so sorry, John, that I missed also the last part of your speech. So apologies to everybody if this is, is if this repeats up some some of the things that John said. Uh, my real respect for whistleblowers sort of flourished when I became chair of the Public Accounts Committee, because a huge amount of the work that we did in trying to hold uh, government to account for um, uh, our money, spending our money. And the work that I started doing there, which I've carried on around tax avoidance, tax evasion, which has moved across the spectrum now into corruption. Uh, a lot of that work was facilitated by the bravery of individual uh, whistleblowers. And I think the thing, there, there are a couple of things, lessons I learned from that. was That was from 2010 to 2015 when I was doing that job. One of the things was that Jonathan talked about respect for whistleblowers. I think what shocked me hugely was the way that those organisations uh, where there was a whistleblower responded to it. And I'm going to take two examples. One was PricewaterhouseCoopers, where we had a big uh, 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 tranche of, 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 of leaked documents which demonstrated that uh, they were sort of into an industrial marketing of a tax avoidance scheme in Luxembourg. And the other was HSBC and the Swiss branch of HSBC, where again a whistleblower showed, uh, revealed through documents that uh, that particular branch of HSBC was involved in at the best tax avoidance, in my view, tax evasion, uh, supporting their clients in tax evasion uh, in the way that they uh, used their money in Switzerland and then uh, spread it across the world. And what shocked me from both, Peter, both, you know, two prestigious organisations, PricewaterhouseCoopers, for whom I had worked for a couple of years before I became an MP, and HSBC, with whom I bank, was that they treated the whistleblowers as thieves. That there was no you know, no acceptance of the importance of the information that was revealed by the whistleblowers and that there was a fury there is, that they were thieves. And in fact, they pursued them, Jonathan, very much in the way that they pursued you, trying to get them imprisoned and succeeding in one case for a little while, uh, imprisoned for the work they had done in revealing documents. They had, in the, in the view of the organisation, they'd stolen them. Uh, and we just couldn't have done all our work uh, in the Public Accounts Committee without the support of whistleblowers. So I think they are central. Um, I also, this, that's the first thing I want to say. The second thing I want to say is that the, the title of this is the first line of defence. And I don't want whistleblowers to be the first line of defence. And this is where I hope John and I can work together in Parliament. Uh, and this is where all these reforms that to tackle uh, the corruption that has made the UK a jurisdiction of choice for too much corrupt activity is so important. And I put it into four categories. The first is we need much, much better transparency, hence moves like the one of having a public register of beneficial ownership of uh, properties owned from abroad. We need much tougher regulation, hence for example, the support of uh, a company's house, which we've been waiting for so long. We need much stronger enforcement, and I'll come back to that, um, uh, the, even where the agencies have powers to pursue corruption. Uh, they fail to do so either because of lack of resources or because of, of a reluctance to use the law actually to pursue uh, 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 bad bad behavior and the final thing is public accountability and i would put in that as well the accountability of all those people working in the financial services sector and in, in particularly in london whether it's lawyers whether it's banks whether it's accountants whether it's advisor who 
at the best collude, at the worst facilitate um, uh, a fraudulent activity. And Liz, you talked at the beginning about Credit Suisse. It isn't just that they ignored it. I think in that particular tranche of the leaks, they facilitated it. So I would not put, I, I would put uh, whistleblowing as an important line of defense, but I think there's a huge amount of action that we need to take around transparency, regulation, enforcement, and accountability, of which I've only just given examples, which would help it, help us ensure that we don't need whistleblowers quite so much. That's the first thing. The second thing is my frustrating experience that um, whenever I do get uh, information from a whistleblower and I do give it to a government agency, it just seems to fall down a big black hole and I never hear anything again. And even when I pursue the issue with uh, the relevant government agency, I never get a satisfactory answer back as to whether the matter was properly investigated on the back of the whistleblower's information or whether it ever led to activity. And the two, I've got a current case of somebody who wrote to me about a real fraudulent claim um, around uh, uh, the furlough scheme where I've written, I've rewritten, I've written, uh, I've met H uh, HMRC and I still haven't got an answer as to why uh, there hasn't been action taken or whether in fact the whistleblower, where's the whistleblower, I would, even if they said to me the whistleblower uh, information wasn't good enough, that would be fine. I just have not a response. And then my biggest example uh, in my other period was around Google, because when we did the uh, uh, when we did the public uh, hearings around Google's behavior and not paying a tax and their claim that they were not undertaking economic activity here in the UK, uh, I can't tell you how much I got from whistleblowers saying that uh, they had been uh, 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 they had lied in effect about where their economic activity was taking place. And again, tons of stuff I gave to to the authorities. It never never came back. I never got an answer back. So we need those structures within our government, but we also need them to act. And it's partly about resourcing, but it's a partly about a political will to respond. The final thing I want to say about uh, uh, whistleblowing is that I'm all for modernizing the legislative framework. And clearly, uh, you know, with thanks to Protect and Lee Day for putting on today's event, that is important. But I just want to uh, uh, make an observation, which really Jonathan's sort of, uh, Jonathan's contribution showed. Whistleblowing is horrible. It's really, really hard for the individual involved. And when we tried at the Public Accounts Committee to have a session just examining whistleblowing, in a sense, it wasn't a very satisfactory ses uh, session because we could only find one of the many, many whistleblowers who had come to us who was willing to give public evidence about their experience of whistleblowing. And it isn't just a question of getting the law right and getting the protection in law right. It's actually what happens in the, wor in the work environment to the whistleblower um, after they have blown that whistle. And it just becomes a really, and I don't know how we can deal with this. I've thought about it a lot. Maybe you've got better ideas. I don't know how we can better protect whistleblowers uh, to carry on. And as Jonathan said, will he ever get a job again in, in, in his speciality for which he's got both the qualifications and the experience? And it's really hard. And my greatest regret on that is that uh, uh, is the man who worked for HMRC who started us on this whole journey of investigating uh, uh, tax avoidance evasion and then uh, illicit uh, financial crime. Um, he was a lawyer who worked for HMRC. He gave us the evidence which demonstrated that HMRC had entered into a sweetheart deal with Goldman Sachs, who was the uh, uh, first people that we investigated um, in the Public Accounts Committee. I time and time and time again, I mean, when, when it all emerged, his computer was hacked, um, his wife's telephone was hacked, his marriage broke down. Um, uh, and time and time again, I would say to the head of HMRC when she gave evidence to us, are you protecting the whistleblower? And she always gave me uh, reassurances that she was, but life was made so intolerable for the individual that in the end, 
he had to leave, he had to retrain, and his life also, like Jonathan's, was destroyed in many, many ways by the experience of whistleblowing. And how we get a culture in our society that respects and actually thanks whistleblowers for the, for the job they do, I think is an enormous challenge that we all face. Thank you very much indeed, Margaret. That was a, a wonderful uh, overview of the, the very many different uh, prongs that we need to, to better protect with blurs. And that's a challenge we can throw out to the audience later about, you know, what do we need to do to change the cultures in our organisation? Because as you say, it's not just legislation. A huge amount of that is, is the culture. But maybe there's something as well in, in the regulators that we can come back to as well about, you know, do, they don't have a duty of care. They don't have any responsibilities at the moment towards whistleblowers um, and and it's very frustrating for whistleblowers and for you obviously when you throw your information in there and then hear nothing further so maybe that's something we can pick up as well in in the uh, in the conversations afterwards thank you so much i'll turn now to um to paul and who's going to give us a, an overview about the very interesting for all the lawyers in the audience and i know there's quite a lot of them it's a it's a really interesting case and it's it's broken new ground in in terms of whistleblowing so over to you paul Thanks. Thanks, Liz. So, yeah, I'm just going to talk briefly about this, uh, the case of Amjad Rehan that uh, Liz uh, alluded to before um, and just outline some of the uh, wider implications uh, that, that I see coming out of that case uh, in terms of legal protections for workers who become embroiled in corruption overseas through no fault of their own. So Mr. Rehan's case concerned allegations that EY, um, he was a former partner at, 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 uh, or a partner at the time at EY, um, and he uh, claimed that EY had covered up the adverse findings of a sustainability audit uh, into a Dubai gold refiner, including evidence of money laundering and conflict minerals. Um, uh, he ended up resigning, fleeing Dubai, um, and um, so during the course of the audit, uh, he and his team had, had uncovered serious money laundering red flags, so billions of dollars worth of cash transactions, gold bars being imported from Morocco, which had been painted with silver to avoid uh, restrictions on uh, exports of gold from Morocco. Um, he came under pressure from the uh, both the gold refiner and the Dubai regulator, which is an organ of the Dubai government, um, uh, to uh, water down the findings of the audit report, uh, try and brush it under the carpet. Uh, the regulator, the Dubai authorities were keen to protect the uh, gold industry in Dubai, which is big business there. So Mr. Rehan escalated his concerns about the pressure he was coming under to EY's senior executives in London. Um, but instead of supporting him uh, in resisting the pressure he was getting in Dubai from the regulator and, and, and the audit client, um, they proceeded to engineer an approach whereby the damaging findings would never see the light of day. Um, uh, meanwhile, he and his family fled Dubai in fear of uh, their, their safety because he was now left sort of isolated in the f uh, hadn't received any institutional support from EY. Um, he was left isolated there in his, his position um, in opposition to the, to the approach that was being taken by the Dubai authorities. Um, he uh, came to the UK, uh, left EY, went public with his allegations. Um, and then after being publicly uh, identified as a whistleblower, um, what uh, Jonathan uh, was saying certainly rings true with uh, Amjad Rehan in that he was never able to secure alternative employment in that industry. Again, his career was uh, completely destroyed. Um, so three, uh, three years of contentious uh, legal proceedings uh, later, the case went to trial in uh, February 2020 and in April 2020 the court handed down its judgment um, and it found uh, in favour of Mr Rehan, it found that senior EY global executives had consistently acted in breach of their uh, professional and ethical standards when dealing with his concerns um, including presenting misleading audit reports um, by way of example, uh, the court found that, uh, that, that EY had amended uh, the gold refiner's reference to silver-coated gold bars in its audit report 
describing it instead as documentary irregularities. Um, the court found that by colluding with the Dubai regulator in its efforts to conceal the damaging audit findings, uh, EY had breached its duties of integrity, objectivity and professional behaviour and it awarded uh, Mr Rehan 10.8 million US dollars in, in damages. Um, EY appealed but then uh, withdrew that appeal in December 2020 and so the case um, ended then and, and, and Mr Rehan definitively won. Um, so in terms of the wider implications of, of this for whistleblowers, um, the court created an important new duty to ensure that individuals working in an overseas uh, context, so overseas operations of UK companies, that um, a duty not to embroil them in unethical conduct, which means that whistleblowers who are working for multinational organisations may be able to obtain substantial compensation even when they fall outside of the scope of the Employment Rights Act, which doesn't protect currently overseas workers. So it's closed that uh, an important gap there in, in, in the law, um, particularly because it's in overseas environments where workers may end up coming uh, 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 or being exposed to the most acute risks of being embroiled in unethical conduct. They may be in a place where there's weak local regulation um, uh, or simply a tolerance of conduct that's not acceptable by UK regulatory or, or legal standards. And secondly, connected to that first point, it's now clear that as far as English law is concerned, English professional conduct regulations trump the rules or directives of a foreign regulator. So EY had uh, consistently tried to argue that um, all they needed to do was follow what they were being told by the regulator in Dubai. Well, um, the court said, no, that's not sufficient. You have to comply with your own professional standards um, where, where, where there's a conflict. Um, uh, thirdly, the, the, the Rehan case was unique because it, it, it was not brought against the claimant's employer, not brought against Mr Rehan's direct employer in Dubai, but against these UK-based governing entities of EY, um, and uh, it, so it raised this important legal issue as to whether those entities could be liable to, to, to him where they weren't his actual employer, and the High Court found that, um, that, that they could um, pr on the basis that they'd assumed control over the whole, whole issue and, and interacted with Mr Rehan to a major extent, so that was an important development as well. Um, just, just finally, um, um, which is an issue that perhaps we can touch on later, um, which is one that uh, Jonathan raised as well, which is this point about legal costs. Um, bringing the case in this way outside of the employment tribunal regime did enable Mr Rehan to um, fund his case via a conditional fee agreement, so a no-win, no-fee agreement, um, which meant that he, he could get funding for his legal costs as, as the case Went, went along. That, that's not available in the, in, in the employment tribunal currently. Um, litigants have to fund their own legal costs. I mean, um, we can, as I say, come, come on to it later, but that is a big issue in my view, is the fact that you get the employment tribunal, there is no funding for legal costs. You get um, lots of uh, uh, litigants who end up just having to represent themselves against major corporations, and that is the most fundamental issue I feel that needs to be um, be addressed in terms of getting access to justice for, for whistleblowers. So yeah, I'll leave it, leave thank it there. You, uh, thank you very much for explaining it to us and I think, you know, I do hope we can pick that up, that hurdle up, uh, you know, the huge imbalance of powers that we've heard in Amjad's case, in in uh, Jonathan's case and, and indeed in many whistleblowing cases. It's the, it's the individual against the company, the multinational um, and the resources that each have are just so um, unfair. But I'm going to turn now to Andy and give you the really tricky job, Andy, of trying to summarise some of what, what we've heard today with, with what Protect thinks and synthesise that beautifully, as I know you can, uh, to, to, <laughs> to, uh, to tell us a little bit about what, what you think we should, we should be doing and, and pulling together some of those themes that we've had today. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yes. Yeah, hello, everybody. Uh, yeah. So... Um, I'm going to try and answer Jonathan's question about the Taylor test, which I think is a, it's a good way to think of it. But um, I do think there are two types of whistleblowers that I want to try and address. So the first 
isn't going to pass a tailor test, but is, is important. It's those individuals that spot corruption or fraud in the workplace. They want to raise it with their employer. I think all whistleblowers want to do that. But it's not a case of working for an employer that Jonathan was working for that was corrupt really in terms of its business model or from top to bottom in terms of an organisation. And so in that situation, I think it is a case that the legal framework is useful to think about in terms of, as John Penray said, like how do you make the Public Interest Disclosure Act, which protects whistleblowers through the Employment Tribunal, much more cutting edge. And I'd say one of those areas is duties on employers. So the ability to have something in place that says, well, employers will have these standards that they will be held to account via regulation or via sort of laws to um, so that those whistleblowers coming forward with concerns um, can be uh, reassured that things like confidentiality, feedback, the concerns being looked into are going to be all sort of covered by that law. So I think that's really important. But I think the other side, which has always been part of whistleblowing, I think from when the law was passed in 1998, is the idea that whistleblowing cannot work unless there's external routes. So the ability to go to the media, the ability to go to regulators. And that's a key point, which is the idea that you need effective regulators. And so standards on regulators in terms of, as Margaret was saying, feedback, that's a massive issue. Whistleblowers really hear nothing when they go to most regulators. Even regulators like the Financial Conduct Authority that have sort of whistleblowing um, arrangements that they force banks to have, they won't give very, they give very little feedback to the whistleblower in terms of what's happening with their concerns, and that's a, a key issue. But also I think there are resource issues as well. Lots of regulators, especially in this case, in the situation of um, anti-corruption, are, are, are underfunded. So Spotlight on Corruption found that the National Crime Agency's budget decreased by 4.2%, um, and also the Crown Prosecution Service saw their budget cut by 33%. So I think, I think one of the things that I struggle maybe as head of policy at Protect to answer, because I'm not necessarily expert in different kind of areas of, of legal enforcement is you can have a really effective maybe ability to approach a, re a regulator in terms of passing information on, but what happens to those concerns when they are passed on? And that's a key sort of issue. But I think to turn to Jonathan, the Taylor test for any legal reform, what I would say is that um, slaps are used to really not to really get to court. The, the, the idea is not to bring the whistleblower to court, it's to, dri to kind of drive them down into the dirt. And I think, I, I do probably think actually more to a wider sort of civil defence shield or public interest defence within um, sort of civil law and criminal law would really help because I think it would, it would make lawyers think twice. They would have an, an architecture that you could cling to. And we're seeing this in the EU directive. There is a civil litigation shield there. But I think the other thing, and I'm going to stop in a minute because we're <laughs> going to take questions, but I think the other thing is um, access to justice. There's such a disparity of arms. It's, it's getting probably worse, I think. It's not getting better in terms of companies um, have, having the ability to hire lawyers. I know from working on Jonathan's case, um, more from the parliamentary end, but I know that civil society picked up the bill to help Jonathan when he was stranded in Croatia um, fighting that extradition case. Or it was lawyers like Toby Cadman doing basically work on pro bono. And that doesn't feel right to me when the level of fines that, that, that Jonathan sort of brought forward, um, that there isn't a way for those um, law enforcement bodies to, as Liz said, have a duty of care towards a whistleblower beyond maybe their own kind of infrastructure or um, you know, their own processes in how they handle those concerns, which I think is really important. But I think at the end of the day, you need the ability for uh, regulators, well, do you need re regulators to see a role in helping defend or fund um, those type of legal actions when it's outside of the employment tribunal or outside of labour laws? Because that's a, you just undermine every single whistleblowing protection if, uh, if, if employers can reach into different forums to pursue a whistleblower. Yes, and that's a, a very sombre note to end on, um, but uh, I hope um, I hope we've given everybody a really broad overview of, of the challenges based from ranging from the culture inside organisations um, and across society, the regulation and the lack or thereof of enforcement. The Taylor test is one that we'll come back to and protect. How do we properly protect whistleblowers and give them access to some better equality of arms? But I'm going to turn now to the audience and thank you very much for listening. And any questions that you'd like to put to the panel? Yes, please. Do you want to say who you are? And, and uh, yeah. My name's Dennis O'Connor. I'm, I'm a recovering 
uh, banking compliance officer. Um, and through my career, one case I, uh, I developed, uh, I saw cor some corruption going through my bank, a client, a customer, a foreign customer, work it up to an SAR, submit the SAR, eventually civil servants and politicians abroad got banged up. Uh, but the, the corruption was instigated by a French multinational. It took the French authorities 10 years to find the multinational. But my question is, uh, but if there's any American lawyers in here today, they would point to the US system of statutory reward reimbursement. Uh, the SEC, DOJ, those sorts of people paying substantial sums of like tens of millions of dollars to whistleblowers in the case of a, a prosecution. That doesn't seem to be the flavour or in favour in this country. Do members of the panel think we should have a US style reimbursement system? Thank you, that's a really good question. Uh, shall we put that to, to John Penrose first? What do you think? Should we change the system of how we effectively compensate whistleblowers for the for the very, you know, the life-changing losses that they have? Do, is the employment tribunal the best way, the only way, or should we look to rewards? Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of torn between two opposing um, factors here. Um, one is I, I'd be worried that we'd be creating moral hazard um, for someone to uh, to try and if, if they've got a if they've got an in, a personal reward incentive uh, to big up their their evidence, that's clearly uh, not something which we want for for any kind of case, whistleblower driven or not. And um, so we would need to be careful to avoid moral hazard. I'm not saying it can't be avoided, but we would need to worry about that and be careful. But I'm completely on side with the notion that if not this, then something needs to be in place. So that people like John Taylor or any other whistleblower who gets completely monstered, um, so they can't walk, work again in their in their chosen sector, that they actually have some way of paying the gas bill um, for you know in future as well. And and the, you know, the the Jonathan's example, I'm afraid, it was was you know, heart wrenching to listen to, but it is far from unique. That's the problem. So we need to find some way of making sure that people know that the personal consequences for them will be survivable. Um, and some of them are emotional, but some of them are financial. So if not this, then something better than where we are at the moment um, is clearly, clearly necessary. Thank you for that. Um, and of course, the employment tribunal here, we have uncapped damages, but that does require you to be able to bring a claim in the UK. And both Jonathan and Amjad were not in that position um, and to succeed in a, in a very difficult uh, climate. But uh, Margaret, do you have a view on, on whether rewards is the way forward for whistleblowers? Do we need that here? My, my only reluctance is this issue that I don't think the state should pick up the tab um, on it. And, it, you know, if you're whistleblowing against uh, a, a, an organisation that has, uh, and the, we've all discussed today, big organisations, these are, you know, these are not insubstantial uh, corporations that can afford it. I think uh, it should fall to them rather than the state. And I just make a plea to you because I, th I think that, you know, we're, we're, you're, we're sitting here in a law, well, you're sitting in a law firm and the, the uh, it, it always seems easiest to you know, talk about financial compensation and um, legal, legal uh, you know, trying, trying to find legal ways in which to uh, find an answer. But I don't think that deals with this issue. I, I, with Jonathan's big issue, you know, if it, it's going to pass the Taylor test what happens to Jonathan next year? So I, on the money, on the money, I would I would be reluctant for the state to pick up the tab, if I'm honest. Can I come back on that? Because I think Margaret's absolutely right about, you know, this shouldn't be the taxpayer having to fund it. But also, um, if you can make sure that it's clear who has to pay the damages to the whistleblower, and it's their, you know, the, the person they were whistleblowing against, um, you can also then, I think, start to envisage a system in future, which might build in a really bigger incentive 
um, to the employer to not monster the whistleblower in the way that routinely happens at the moment. Because if they know that if they monster the whistleblower and the and the, the damage that they inflict is so terrible, that they are the people on the hook for putting that damage right financially, they might actually start to say, hang on a second, let's try and minimise that damage. Let's try and not monster them quite so severely up front. That might be um, one of the things that gets them to think again and think early rather than when it's too late. A point of information, yeah, the system in the States only kicks in when the authorities have levied a penalty yeah. on the company. So the taxpayer does not pick it up. It's a diversion. It comes out of the fine. It's a diversion of the fine. Right. Thank you for that clarification. I don't know if Jonathan or Paul want to pick up on either of this question. Do you have a burning response on this or um, so I was I was actually gonna uh, mention exactly what the uh, the the, the uh, question Questioner um, Rose, of course, that, you know, the, the idea of these these fines, any percentage that whistleblower does get comes out of the fines as opposed to the state. Uh, personally, um, I would just look at something just far more basic than that, just just support. I was going in and out to the offices of the Serious Fraud Office, helping uh, the SFO in relation to details of Rolls Royce corruption. So SBM, my former employer, used the same Brazilian agent to pay bribes. I was helping them when the then Home Secretary, someone called Theresa May, um, gave leave for the Brazilian um, investigators to have an extra ter ter territorial um, uh, investigation in the UK. So I attended their offices to speak with the Brazilians. I helped them with the UNOR case. Um, I did everything and anything I could. There's, there was new information I came up with um, just before um, uh, my exile in Croatia. Um, I, I got not one... Um, not one gram of help from the British government. I'd gone out of my way to do all I could um, to, to assist the SFO in every possible way. Every time they called up, I went round. They came to see me occasionally. But when, and I was wrung dry, if you will, for information. But when push came to shove, I was hung out to dry, no assistance whatsoever. So yes, financial assistance would help, but way beyond that, just practical assistance, just standing up for me, representing my issues at a governmental level would have been nice. Right. Thank you. And I think that's a very good, um, a very good question that, that John Penrose poses. If not rewards, then, then is there a better solution? Andy, do you want to sort of set out what, what we think of protect around rewards? Um, yeah, I, I think I'd probably just um, say on rewards, one of the reasons we don't support them at Protect is they, if you look at the US, um, they um, in fact help a very small number of people. So the idea in the US is it's quite novel information that comes forward. Um, so it's usually the one person that gets that slice of the fine. So there are lots of criticisms about the UK approach, but the Public Interest Disclosure Act carries across multiple sectors, multiple industries. And part of that is also, I think, um, something to bear in mind is that um, Whistleblowing in the UK is quite much wider as well. You know, fines are not issued in safeguarding cases or health cases with clinical kind of malpractice. Um, so I, I think there are two different systems, and you're, you, there's a danger, I think, in this debate sometimes that you can um, compare apples with oranges. But to answer the actual question, <laughs> which is, if not what instead, I think it is a case of legal aid or a fund from fines that can be used to support the whistleblower because I don't I don't think it is just about money um it is also about support and I I I agree with Jonathan completely in the sense that it was completely when we were campaigning to try and get Jonathan um from its tradition it was even hard to get the British government to acknowledge that he was even a whistleblower <laughs> so it's like I feel like um the regulators can do so much more in terms of what they say how they interact um, with the whistleblower to give that sort of practical support because it's it's sorely lacking when it gets to that point. Liz, just to come in on that, I think that's an area where we could put duties on the regulators. I mean, the FCO was appalling in Jonathan's uh, case. You know, uh, um, uh, they just they did everything they could do to avoid getting involved, really, rather than accepting responsibility for a British citizen who was stranded abroad because he'd been a whistleblower. It was extraordinary. So I think, um, and maybe John would sort of support that with me, but I, I think the idea of putting duty, uh, you know, and the same is true of HMRC, the same is true of the NCA, all these organizations where whistleblowers will tend to, or the SFO, uh, all these organizations where whistleblowers will tend to go, 
ought to have duties on them. And that might and that might have helped my man in HMRC, who then got um, uh, also had to leave his job in the end. Great. I mean, I think that's not a bad idea. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I, yeah, let's, we'll, we'll be certainly lobbying you in due course for all of these changes. Um, uh, another question. I've got one here and then maybe the gentleman at the back. So, Ian, do you want to introduce yourself and, and ask your question? Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, my name's Ian Foxley. I'm the CEO of a, an organisation called Parhesia, who looks to influence uh, policy makers in order to change the law to better protect whistleblowers. Um, I'm also the whistleblower behind the Airbus scandal and GPT that took 10 years, 11 years to bring to court and resulted in a fine for, well, a DPA for Airbus that resulted in 3.6 billion and 30 million pound fine for the subsidiary GPT involved in corruption in Saudi Arabia. So everything that John has spoken about and been through, been there, done that, and I empathise greatly with you, sir. Um, my observation is that this is about what, when, and how. The what is how do we counter the two fears that Elizabeth raises, which are the primary reasons why people do not speak up. First is fear for home, health, work, and wealth, and everything that Jonathan raised falls into those four categories and secondly how do we make them more effective how do we how do we make sure that when people do stand up and speak up they actually get a result it's not just a, a voice crying in the wilderness so the counters to those i think effectively is, is very simple it's making the regulators regulate and forcing them to do it. And if they won't do it themselves and set up an independent body that will hold them to account and gives whistleblowers an alternative access to somebody who has the power to give them a voice and make them effective, a commissioner or an officer of the whistleblower, whatever you want to call it. And secondly, we take sanctions against anybody who takes reprisals against that whistleblower who has stood up and spoken up. And that needs legislation. That needs a statutory act to give that independent body the ability to fine or to disqualify individuals. Because it's not just the organization, it's the individuals within that organization who affect the mechanisms of the organization to protect itself against the individual and what he's trying to say. And that brings me to the last point and the real question which is when. And I find it, I'm sorry, John, but I find John Penrose, I find it rather dispiriting to hear that, that there is no set timetable for this. I, I, I thought that the, the year three report on your first strategy was, was, I'm sorry, but you failed slightly. You as an organization in the Home Office, Jack, who failed with not pushing the whistleblowing agenda and the measures that you put at priority three. And that does need rectification. And we've spoken about this, and you know that, and it, I hope it does feature in the next strategy. But it needs more than that. It needs to hang on a piece of legislation. And we started this evening talking about Ukraine and what's going on. We as a country and we as NATO are not going to take on Russia physically. We are not going to get into World War III. Therefore, we have to find another way. Another way is the economic way. Bring, the, bring about the economic pain. Bring the change from within Russia by closing down all those corrupt people who are burying money in our society. And we have an ideal platform now to hang whistleblowing protective measures who are at the back of revealing where this money is and how it happens on the back of an economic crime bill. And I think that is exactly what Parliament should be doing now, is putting its foot down and saying this is absolutely key to where we go as a country and where we, Europe, stand up to the bullies in the world. So my question is, when and how are you going to do that? Thank you very much, Ian. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll ask, I think we'll just, we'll just ask Margaret and John if they've got any any answer on the time frames here? It's a tricky, it's a tricky one. But um, and I think John, you've, you've kind of given us your answer already. But if you just want to come back to, to Ian there, just, just very shortly, because you, you're right. I, I, I mentioned this in my opening comments. 
Um, look, you know, no argument that we are behind. I, I said it right at the start. I, I'm not happy with it. Um, and we need to press ahead. And I think there are two things we need to do. One is to actually just implement what we've already got much more thoroughly and do much better enforcement, and much more delivery. But also we will need some, and we can make an awful lot of progress with that even before we get on to extra um, updating legal powers, but those are also necessary. Listen, I'd love to see um, updated whistleblowing powers in the Economic Crime Bill. My only concern is a practical one, which is I think it's already going to turn into a pretty big bill. Um, and if I had to choose, and I hope I don't have to, but if I do have to choose between extra whistleblowing powers in the Economic Crime Bill, or the upgrades to Companies House, then the upgrades to Companies House are even more urgent, even though the whistleblowing powers are absolutely vital too. Um, I hope I can have my cake and eat it. Um, I hope I can we can have both. I'm sure Margaret and I both want that. Um, but that's that that's the you know that, that's the urgency about it, and that's what we've got to get done. Thank you, uh, Margaret. Do do you agree with John? Is there a, or or is there a possibility that we could still get some whistleblowing in even within the huge economic crime bill that we're expecting? Well, the only thing I would say to John, <laughs> having been around forever, you can't miss the opportunity of the Economic Crime Bill. So um, uh, I'm really happy to, to, I hope working with John, but certainly working with you as sort of uh, interested parties to pursue the whistleblowing um, uh, clause in that. Uh, you know, we won't, we won't they, they'll then, the, the way government works, this is our one opportunity. And if we lose this one, you won't get a whistleblowing bill, I bet you, for another three, four, five years, because they'll say, well, we did all this economic crime. We've got other things we want to do. And I mean, let's just, I don't know, John, whether you said this at the beginning, but God knows, I'm, I'm losing track of time. A month ago, we weren't going to have an economic crime bill. When Lord Agnew resigned, uh, one of the reasons for his resignation was that uh, 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 they dropped it, much to all our horror. So I think thanks actually to John and others on the Conservative benches, it's now been reinstated. Sadly, on the back of this, it's get, it, uh, uh, the Ukraine crisis, it's getting prioritised. But I would just urge you, John, you know, we won't get another opportunity soon. We've got to do it now. Or we'll, you know, it'll just fall into the long, la long grass. You're preaching to the choir. I, mean, I just, I just want to, you know, just the problem with it will be that the the uh, the company's house stuff will, will inevitably rank higher. But if we can get both in, we should. Thank you. That that's really wonderful news, and we'll do everything we can. And I know we'll work with Ian um, as well to make sure we give you some some possible amendments there. I'm going to take one more question because I know we're running over, and we have some drinks afterwards. So I hope you'll all be able to carry on the discussions after. Have you got one quick question at the back here? Uh, yeah. Uh, Sorry, I'm just standing up so that people in the front can see me. Uh, my name is Franz Wild. I'm with the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. Um, just a, a, two quick questions, in fact, because we've got so little time. Um, the, f the first one is obviously, I think most of the whistleblowers not only experience sort of slap suits, but also all sorts of other uh, attacks. Is there, do you see any scope for uh, that being included in any kind of legislation? I mean, I know the type of attacks, kind of surveillance, uh, hacking, uh, eavesdropping, it's fairly amorphous, but is there scope for in including that in some way? And secondly, I mean, you've sort of touched on this, but I've been following this issue for about eight years, and there, or six years rather, sorry, and the, the debate's kind of been the same, and I know it's sort of going to be in the Economic Crime Bill, but why has it actually taken this long? Because it doesn't seem to be an issue that's particularly contentious. I think that's a really good point. And we've, we can see here with, uh, with John and Margaret, both you know, from opposite sides of the political spectrum, but it's not a party political issue. It's an absolutely, if you get whistleblowing, you get how important it is. And I think that's a really good question. On the SLAPS issue, I mean, we're part of a, a consortium of organisations that, uh, that, are, that are pushing the SLAPS issue hard. I don't know if anybody uh, wants to comment on that. Do, is is uh, countering the uh, strategic litigation um, argument, is that something that, is, that there'll be any appetite in Parliament for? Margaret, perhaps I'll come to you first. Well, the, the interesting thing on the SLAPS issue, sadly, I, I had COVID, but David Davis, who is another Conservative, um, led, you know, a, a, a very powerful adjournment debate. I don't know if John got in on it. I was just wasn't around that day, but uh, on, on the SLAPS issue. So there is, again, cross-party consensus. Let me just say this. I don't know whether I said my opening remarks or not. I think there's a real, I think in the back benches, there is greater 
uh, 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 un unanimity than there is with the government. And I think the problem with all this stuff with the government is, you know, is there's this real fear, dare I say it, post-Brexit, when the economy's been sort of hit, you know, you've got 2% reduction in the economy as a result of Brexit. Uh, there's a fear of taking on the very powerful um, uh, financial services sector and all the associated sectors with it, which are now, you know, are a much more important part of our economy. And every time, I hope John agrees with this, every time you think you've got agreement around one of these anti-corruption measures, you then find some of these financial institutions or the lawyers, I'm afraid lawyers as well, or, you know, all the accountants going in and banging the drum on the other side. And it's really, and I think government is very, very fearful of, uh, of challenging their, their, um, their, their power. Well, I'll give the last word to you then, John, because as the challenger of the government in your anti-corruption role, do you, do you think that there's, you know, is there a movement, is there a feeling in government as well as among the backbenches that these are issues that are important and urgent and need addressing now? Or what more can we do to help you explain those that, that it isn't just uh, something that you can be pushed aside by the, by the, the lobbies? That well, I, I, I've never heard anybody objecting in principle and saying this is this or that anti-corruption measure is the wrong thing to do. And whether it's the company's house reform stuff we've just been talking about or indeed um, whistleblowing measures. So I've never heard anybody turning around saying, you know, we don't think this is sensible in principle. Um, it's much more common, I find, um, that the, the problem, you know, and we've had Brexit and then we had the pandemic, it's much more common just to say, look, there are a whole load of other things which are even more urgent and, and they're blotting out the sun and therefore we've got to do this or that instead. Um, so I, I think it's a problem of, um, sad to say, um, political sexiness or lack of it. And this is important. We all understand the uh, the importance of it and the urgency of it. Um, but the difficulty is compared to all the other stuff where there's a burning platform over there and over there and over there on other issues too. And um, we've got pushed backwards down lists of priorities. And that's why um, I think, I don't know, um, but I'm guessing that that's why Lord Agnew um, saw that the economic prime, prime bill was dropped in um, a couple of weeks ago from the, uh, from the, um, next Queen's speech and why we all had to jump up and down and, and, and with our hair on fire to get the thing reinstated. Um, I think that's the problem. Um, and I think that we need, I mean, I, I, so Margaret is right, we won't get enough um, opportunities. We need to grab whichever ones we can and shoehorn as much as we can into this um, when the opportunity um, pre presents itself. But I don't think it's a problem of, of, um, of closet opposition in principle. I think it's a problem of bandwidth and of urgency and of dare I say it, political sexiness. Well, that's a challenge back to us then. We've got to make this uh, this <laughs> issue politically sexy and a burning platform. And that's that's our challenge for Protect. And we're going to carry on campaigning and we'll be lobbying John, Margaret and, and other MPs as well. I just want to, I wonder if the audience here could just thank our, um, our uh, esteemed um, guests on the screen over there for their contributions. It's been a really interesting debate. Uh, so shall we just give uh, John, Margaret and Jonathan um, uh, and, and Paul mm -hmm. for his wonderful contribution and mm -hmm. thank you to Andy too. Can we give everybody uh, a round of applause?